Chapter 2 Inquisition One of the most powerful forces during the period of the dark was the Church of Tao. Its origins are thought to have been in a union of two small sun worshiping cults among the early Yodians, though the Church itself went out of its way to erase all traces of its humble beginnings. The Church also went out of its way to erase all traces of magic and magicians during this period as well. While magic would survive, and eventually triumph against the oppression, the same cannot be said for most, the same cannot be said for those most unfortunate sorcerers who were brought before the Inquisition of the Church of Tao. Arkal, Argivian Scholar The chamber was relatively opulent, at least by standards of the modern day and age. It had an internal fireplace, and the walls beneath the thick tapestries were made of stone. Joda noticed the heavy tables and chairs made of solid wood, and the thick curtains partially covered a leaded window to keep the night air at bay. Most of all, Joda noticed a large number of metal pokers and tongs that were resting with their tips in the fireplace itself. The tips glowed red like goblin eyes. The trip back to the wall city of al had taken most of the rest of the evening, and it was now only hours from dawn. The best time for an inquiry, Bosca had noted with sarcasm, since most executions were scheduled to take place as the cloud-filled sky lightened with promise of a sunrise that would never come. Bosca had been manacled by Brother Tanar with ornate bracers fastened at the wrist, so he had to hold his arms crossed in front of him. The bracers looked like cast iron, but were inset with a spidery pattern of silvery metal. The pattern looked like spun sugar set into the darker metal. Early on, Fosca had wiggled his fingers, and the tracery glowed with a dull silver light. Fosca choked back a scream and fell to his knees, putting his head against his manacled wrist. Don't try that again, said Brother Tanar, as he handed Fosca to his feet. Joda thought he knew what the that was, and he attempted to mentally tap the magical forces of the land. The manacles apparently had some type of anti-magic property. How else would you imprison a magician if you had no magic yourself? They did not manacle Joda, but marched him alongside Vasca, a pair of guards behind them. They did not seem to care what Joda did or said, as long as it did not involve escape. Where are they taking us? Joda had asked softly. Al Sur, replied Vasca. The older mage's voice was thick and syrupy, and the blood had dried in a dark river, stemming from one side of his mouth. The soldiers had bandaged his wounded arm, but left the damage inflicted by Tanner unattended, as a warning. The church is strongest in the cities, and we are being taken to a church court. Why a church court? asked Joda. Because magic is a crime against humanity, said Vasca, with a soft chuckle that bellied his current state and only the church is powerful enough and wise enough to rule on such crimes. Joda dropped his voice a little. But why didn't they chain me up as well? Because, Vasca said, and the amused tone was back in his voice. You were not witness casting a spell, and until you do, you are innocent under church law. They would not chain the innocent, only the guilty. They are not animals, you know. There was another small chuckle and a hint of triumph however minor, in Vasca's voice. Joda was unsure about the comment about the Alsurians not being animals. The guards had returned from their pursuit of the goblins with a collection of grisly trophies, heads and hands, that were dumped into a bag and brought along with them. Joda noted that at least one of the trophy heads had the hair burned from it, and he wondered if Vasca would be credited with the kill. Now, in the enclosed chamber on the second floor of the church embassy in Alsur, Joda looked at the heated tongs and pokers in the fireplace and wondered again about the humanity of the Alsorians. He felt a shiver run up his spine, which had nothing to do with the cool, evening air leaking through the curtains. Lovely decor, muttered Bosca to no one in particular. Look what you've done with the place. There was another breeze as a door to their right opened and closed. A massive priest entered, followed by a pair of female scribes. No, the massive figure was a priestess though she looked large enough to beat the Alsurian guards two out of three. She was broad-shouldered and tall, with a lantern jaw and brooding eyes that seemed twisted in a perpetual scowl. She took long, heavy strides to the desk, the hem of her habit gliding along the hard stone floor and sounding to Joda's ears like a legion of snakes. Her robes were white and marked with a double sunburst of tau. In the firelight, her garb was the color of pale and corrupted flesh. The huge priestess sat down, on a massive chair behind the desk. Joda thought Vasco would mention that the chair, a huge ornate monstrosity, 
looked as if it was constructed specifically to hold her frame. But the older man said nothing. The priestess rested her elbows on the oak desk, templed her fingers, and regarded the prisoners. Joda felt another shiver as her eyes swept over him, regarding him and discarding him in the same instant. It felt as if she could peer into his heart, exposing any sin, real or imagined. As he shook, he felt her eyes leave him and pass on to Vasca. She stared at the older man for a longer time, then asked in a gravel-throated voice, What are the charges? One of the scribes, a plain girl who had a holder tablet close to her face, said, Sorcery, your grace. The heavy-set woman let out a grunt. And are there witnesses to the crime? Brother Tanar spoke up now. Ah, oh, your grace, my company was tracking a group of goblin raiders through the northern hills when we witnessed a fountain of unnatural light springing from one of the hillsides. When we arrived, I and my men were witnesses to a battle between the sorcerer and the goblins. The wizard set his opponents alight from a distance with hellfire and witchcraft. My men charged into battle and dispatched the goblins and then arrested the sorcerer. Joda opened his mouth to speak to contest the charge, but there was suddenly a heavy gauntleted hand on his shoulder. The gauntlet belonged to the guard behind him. He looked at Bosca, and the older man just shook his head at him. Are the brother's charges true? said the priestess to the older mage. Well, that depends on your definition of truth, my lady, began Bosca. The priestess interrupted stopping a meaty palm down on the table. I am not your lady. I am Primata Delphine, in the service of the Order of St. Zill, most reverend be her name. I have authority in matters of rooting out sorcery in the eastern city-states, so toy with me at your risk. You will call me your grace, or Primata Delphine. Am I understood? Vasca nodded slowly, carefully digesting both the Primata's words and her heated tone. I understand. You understand what? snapped the Primata. I understand, said Vasca, pausing only for a moment. Your grace? Again, I ask you, she said, pressing her fingers together. Are the brothers' charges true? They are true, and that there was a fountain of light on the hillside, said Vasca solemnly, and that it was likely sorceress in nature. Indeed, my companion and I saw it as well and went there, much like the goblins and Osur's own noble knights, to investigate it. And the charge is that you attacked the goblins with hellfire? prompted Primata Delphine, her tone level as a stone crypt. I would hesitate to say that I attacked anyone, said Vasca, woman to the tail. Rather, the goblins attacked me, or rather us. I had taken the precaution of scooping some hot coals into a cup and tossed it at the goblin leader when he charged toward me. Your grace, said Brother Tanar. The goblins burst into flames at a wave of the sorcerer's hand. I had no idea that goblins were so flammable. Vasca managed a brief shrug, despite his wound and manacled hands. Joda had seen Vasca's act of innocence before, a play usually presented for the benefit of a rent-demanding landlord or an outraged patron. Often, his glib, easy lies brought a smile and occasionally got them off the hook. The priestess sat there stone-faced. Are you saying that a brother in the Holy Church was wrong? Wrong? said Vasca, blinking innocently. I can't imagine a servant of the Holy Church ever being wrong, as they are guided by the light of Tao. I merely state that the illustrious brother, in his zeal and holy fervor, might see one thing and conclude another. The corner of the Pramata's mouth tugged, and Joda thought that as close to a smile as the large priestess was capable of, your wits are nimble, she said, and it takes quick thinking to be a sorcerer. You do not need to be a good case by being quick with your mind or being glib with your tongue. I understand your grace, said Vasca, bowing slightly, and I apprentice your understanding and wisdom in preventing any innocent man from being accused of a horrible crime. Primata Delphine made a noise that was halfway between a chuckle and a grunt. She turned to Joda. And you, boy? Is what your friend says true, or does Brother Tanar speak the truth instead? Her eyes bore into him, and Joda felt his throat constrict and his mouth turn suddenly dry. I, the young man began, then coughed. I saw what my friend Vasca says. I also saw what the good brother described. 
I can understand why the brother feels that there was magic involved, for it seems miraculous that a single man could stand up to a company of goblins. A miracle, added Bosca, seizing on the word. Surely the brother of Tao speaks of miracles, and perhaps the good brother was witness to one here. Silence, snarled the primata, and Joda knew that Bosca had played one card too many in this particular game. The priestess's eyes remained focused on Joda. Your accent is strange, lad, she said. You're a northerner. Joda nodded slightly and responded, I was born in Giva province. Yes, that would make sense. That is a heathen province filled with hedge wizards and sorceresses. You never had school, did you? Joda opened his mouth to protest, then halted himself. When he did speak, he said, I never went to church school, if that's what you mean. I was taught at home. To himself, he added, by those who knew more than ever will. Primata Delphine shook her head sadly. We see so many of you these days. Refugees from Giva. The cold and the snows and the goblins drive so many of your countrymen into civilized lands. And here you are lost, like goats in need of a herdsman. The church, she added, can act as a herdsman, as a guide for you. She rose from behind the desk and slowly walked around it, speaking as she lumbered forward. Long ago, before the devastation, Giva province was called Argive, and it was the home of Urza and Mishra. You have heard of them, of course. She paused long enough for Joda to nod. Giva was a heathen place then, believing in no gods but the dark gods of magic, and the brothers' battle began there. Much of the world is still tainted by the brothers' spells, and the Book of Tao tells us that we have yet to pay the full price for their deviltry. Primata Delphine was in front of the desk now, and looked directly at Joda again. Urza and Misha used magic. Magic is a crime. Worse still, it is a sin. Her features softened for a moment. The sinner may be forgiven, but the sin must be purged. Do you understand? Joda nodded, but slowly this time. Primata Delphine gave a tight-lipped smile. Then answer me truthfully, and fear from fear. Did your companion here use sorcery? Joda did not look at Bosca, but looked straight at the priestess instead. No, ma'am, he didn't. The Primata nodded, and Joda's belly exploded in pain. He doubled from the force of the blow and was pulled upright by the guards behind him. Stars danced before Joda's face, but beyond the stars, he saw Brother Tanar pulling his fist back for another swing. Your grace, said the priestess, leaning back on the desk. It groaned beneath the weight. Not, madam. Address me as your grace or Primata Delphine. I ask you again, did your companion use sorcery? This time, Joda looked at Bosca, but the older man's face was deathly pale and his brows drawn. No, your grace, he started to say, and was rewarded with another hammer punch to the belly before he got the third word out. Repetition did not make the assault easier. Joda tried to cover his stomach, ward off the blow with his arms, but strong hands held him tight by the wrist and shoulders. A short eternity passed as the stars faded from the corners of his vision. For the third and last time, said Primata Delphine, with as even as a voice as if she were discussing the purchase of grapes in the marketplace. Did your ally hear you sorcery? Joda looked at Vasca, and all blood seemed to have drawn out of his face. No, he said simply, and winced in anticipation of the blow. But Brother Tanar did not hit him again. Instead, the churchman moved back toward the curtain window. I understand, said the Primata, and I am saddened to see how far the corruption has spread. Have you known your ally long? Only for the past year and a half, thought Joda, but he said, Only a few weeks. And how did you meet him? She said. My mother died, and the family had abandoned the old manor, thought Joda, when the land finally gave out. When the snows lasted until mid-year's day, one brother went to sea, one went exploring, and before she died, mother made Bosca's promise to look after Joda, to teach him proper magic, a year and a half ago. He said, We met on the road. From Giva? asked the Primata. Yes, said Joda. Many walk sorrow's path, said Primata Delphine, sounding as if she was quoting someone. Many bring their sorrows with them. Then she said, So you met him on the road? Yes, said Joda. You were found far from the road, said the Primata. 
We thought there was a shortcut, said Joda. Then remember Bosca's own tail. And we saw a light. Ah, yes, said the Primata. A light. The light that Brother Tanar and the Goblin saw as well? Joda shrugged. I suppose so. The Primata shook her head. Did your companion mention magic during your travels? No, Your Grace. And did he teach you any magic? She said. Joda looked up and found the eyes boring into him again. No, Your Grace, he managed, but his voice sounded as weak and false as a tin coin. Michelle, said the Primata, and the nearsighted girl set down her tablet and went to the fireplace. She pulled the poker from the flames and walked to the priestess. The tip of the iron spike glowed like an orange-red star. Primata Delphine grasped the poker by the grip and walked towards Vasca. Did you pollute this lad's mind with magic? No, your grace, said Vasca, but his voice was hollow and his eyes never left the tip of the poker. She waved the hot tip inches from Vasca's face. I ask you again, have you taught the boy magic? No, your grace, said Vasca, the tip of the poker edged closer. For the third and last time, did you teach him any of your hellish magics? Vasca swallowed hard and gasped. No, your grace. The Primata stepped back and regarded Vasca carefully. Then she raised the poker again and without looking, pressed it slowly toward Joda's face. Strong hands were again on Joda and the young man tried to lean away from the outthrust instrument. He could feel the heat growing as it approached his face and felt the tears well up in the eye closest to the heat. It already felt as if his cheeks were on fire. Another few inches, and... He heard Bosca's voice gasp. Stop! And the heat receded slowly. Joda looked up at Bosca, and the older man's shoulders were slumped in defeat. Do you have a statement to make? Said Primata Delphine. Her eyebrows raised, the corners of her mouth tugged back in a false smile. Bosca was silent, and the priestess repeated herself. Again, do you have a statement to make? A statement about magic. Bosca looked up at Joda and chewed on his upper lip. A third time I ask, said the Primata, grabbing the hot poker tightly. Do you... Joda, said Vasca, in a voice that seemed to issue from the grave. Show her. Show her? said Joda, blinking in disbelief. If the one sure way to condemn yourself was to cast a spell, asking him to cast a spell before these people was suicide. Did Vasca suddenly want company of the martyr's pyre? Then Joda realized what Vasca was really asking, and he understood. If that's what you wish, the young man said simply, sounding as defeated as Vasca appeared to be. To the primata, he said, Your grace, I will need a bit of space for this, he looked at Vasca. Demonstration. The priestess of the church of Tao smiled fully for the first time, and Joda thought her smile more frightening than anything he had seen in his young life. He reached out over and handed the poker to Michelle, who dutifully returned it to the fireplace. Primata Delphine said, Give him his room, but stand ready. The heavy hands released him. Joda knelt on the floor and realized that part of it was carpeted, a thick, heavy carpet from the north, perhaps from Giva itself. He smoothed out a part of the rug in front of him and began drawing first squares, then circles, then squiggles, and the rug's pile with his finger. Take careful notes said the primata to the one scribe, who was diligently attempting to record all of Joda's nonsense inscriptions. Joda's hands flew over the rug and then left it entirely, tracing symbols in the air. There were trees and butterflies sketched out in the air, along with more squares, and for a brief moment, rude words spelled out quickly. Now, Joda's mind was no longer on the movements of his hands. He was thinking of the manor lands again. He was thinking of home and unlocking the magic held in the memories of those lands. He could feel the power burning, the same power he had felt earlier that evening in the dying light of the day, before he had encountered the goblins and the soldiers, and particularly before he had encountered the church. He conjured in his mind the map of his house, and he was there, standing in the doorway, on the entranceway of white granite and jet. He leaned forward and grasped the spell that he had left there. The motions of his hands grew more frenetic, and Joda began to whisper something. The primata, the guards, the scribes, even Brother Tanar leaned forward to catch his words. Bosco looked away. Joda closed his eyes tightly and hoped that Bosco would do the same. With a final flourish, Joda unleashed his spell. Even through eyes screwed tightly shut, the light was intense, filling his vision. 
Jada could imagine it sprouting upward like a fountain, smashing into the ceiling and spreading outward in an intense column. It only lasted a moment, a moment of intense brilliance. And then the radiance was gone. Jota opened his eyes to find the Primata and most of the others on the ground, shouting and pawing at their blinded eyes. Bosca had been ready for the spell and was now running full tilt toward the curtain windows. Jota suddenly realized that the older man was not alone. He was driving the massive brother Tanar before him, half guiding and half carrying the big man. Tanar had one hand clamped tightly to his eyes and the other waving desperately around looking for something to grab hold of. Bosca and the Holy Brother hit the curtains in the window beyond. The window leading snapped and shattered under the blow, and in an instant, both men were gone, along with the window and a large amount of the curtain, leaving only a huge gaping hole. The night air whipped in through the hole, flapping the remaining curtains in a bitter cold breeze. Joda ran to the jagged opening and looked down. The older man had used Brother Tanar as a cushion to soften his landing. The brother was sprawled face up on the cobblestone street, but Bosco was already rolling free. Come on, shouted the older mage. They aren't going to wait all morning for us to escape. Brother Tanar, still blinded, roused himself and reached out toward the sound of Bosco's voice. The older man wheeled and clubbed the holy brother with his manacled wrist. The brother went down again on the cobblestones. Joda looked back at the wreckage of the room. The primata was already on her feet, leaning on the desk, cursing as tears streamed out her cheeks. Then, Jota looked back down at the street. It was still well before dawn, and the houses were shuttered and silent. Jota jumped. He landed hard and rolled forward slightly. Bosco was at his side once, helping Jota to his feet. You have to get moving. Where are we going? said Jota. We are not going anywhere, said Bosco quickly, but firmly. You are getting out of here as quickly as possible. Steal some clothes. Smuggle yourself out. I don't know how, but you're to get out of Al Sur. I, on the other hand, am going to find a blacksmith. He helped up his chain wrist and shook them for emphasis. Provided I can find one who does not believe too strongly in the Mother Church. I am going with you, said Joda. No, said Vasca sharply. Together they will spot us a mile off. I promised your mother I would protect you, and I'm going to do that. Even if that means I have to lead the church hounds away. Do you understand? But no argument this time, said Vasca, and Joda saw that the older man meant it. The next big city-state is Ged, three days to the south and west. It's a port city. I'll meet you there, at the Harp and Peacock, in five days' time. If I'm not there by the sixth, Vasca paused and cocked his head to listen for approaching guards. The only sound was the Primata's distant cursing. Listen to me. If I can't make it, there is a group of magicians. They are teachers and students, and they try to keep the flame of knowledge alive in these dark times. I want you to search them out. Do you understand? Joda could feel tears beginning to well in the corner of his eyes again, but from a new type of pain. He just nodded. Good, said Bosca, with a smile in his voice. You can do it, lad. You have the gift, the same as your great-great-grandfather. You get out of town, and I'll join you in Ged. All right? Brother Tanar stirred at their feet. Bosco looked down at the bruised and battered brother, and with a heavy foot, booted him solidly across the face. It's a sin to strike a holy man, he said, with mock seriousness. And it's also a crime. But you know, right now, it just feels right. The pair stayed together for a block, passing shuttered windows and closed doors. The air puffed white in front of their mouths, and from far off, there were the first sounds of the city awakening. They came to a Y-shaped intersection. Bosco went right, pointing for Joda to take the left-handed fork. Both knew that within a few minutes, all Surian troops, under the firm command of the church, would be swarming through the streets. Joda hesitated for a moment and saw only Bosco's retreating back. The older mage did not look back. Joda took the left-handed fork. There was no immediate sound of pursuit behind them, and Joda willed himself to slow to a walk. A running man was always guilty, or at least remembered. Around him, the city was starting to come alive, and Jota was heading toward one of the market districts. Already, some of the merchants were stirring, opening the heavy overhanging shutters of their shops to catch the early risers. There was a yeasty smell of bread in the air, and the first pony carts passed him on the street. The sky was lightening now to the gray dawn that seemed to forever hover in the skies over Teresier. Somewhere else in the city, those accused of crimes against the church were being led out to wooden posts set in the square 
and bundles of fire piled around their feet. Joda wondered if Primata Delphine was overseeing that important ritual. No, he decided. She would be shouting at Brother Tanar for his clumsiness and barking orders that the Elsurian troops should find the prisoners and return them. How hard could it be to find a shackled old man and a stripling boy? All too easy, thought Joda, as more people began to fill up the streets. He felt simultaneously protected and vulnerable. His presence on the street of a city in the early morning would be less questioned, but any one of the people on the streets might remember him and pass on the recollection to the guards who would come looking for him. They would have his description, both his and Vasquez. Joda would have to steal different clothes, he realized, and probably shave off his beard and mustache. The last one was a blow against his vanity, for it had taken him a month to get even the sparse growth he had managed, but Joda would rather be alive and unfashionable than look good for the Inquisition's burning stake. He knelt down and checked his boots. The dagger had been confiscated, of course, but the other boots still held the mirror that Bosca had given him. Delphine's Inquisitors had thought so little of him that they had not even searched him for additional weapons. When Joda looked up, he saw the guards. There were a pair of them, lounging outside a vendor's booth, their pikes leaning against the wall. One of them was laconically chewing on a dried apple while the other was talking, apparently about the weather, staring at the lightning sky, and squinting, looking for some hint of the sun. They did not look like soldiers intent on a city-wide manhunt. Indeed, they did not look they were intent on anything more than breakfast and the end of their shift. Still, Joda could not afford to be spotted. He rose slowly and backed up, first one step, then a second. Of course, the guards were not hunting him in Vasco. Where could the two fugitives go? The city state of Alsur was surrounded by walls 10 feet thick and gates mighty enough to withstand all the other city states combined, it was said. The Primata did not have to send troops looking for her prisoners. She could wait until Vasca and Joda tried to leave the city and arrest them at those gates, or the escapees would have to stay within the city walls and wait for the inevitable recapture. Joda took a third step back, and one of the guards glanced up from his apple. A young man walking backward would be suspicious, and Joda froze, and tried to look at a point five feet to the left of the guardsman. The guard surveyed the area over the dried remains of his apple, then went back to his meal, as his partner still watched the sky for a break in the cloud cover. Joda spun on his heels, and headed in the opposite direction, looking for the first alley to dodge down, and hide himself in. There would be more guards in the merchant district, he realized, as the various businesses would be accepting shipments and readying their stock for sale. The worst place for a wanted, escaped prisoner, and the would-be clothes thief. Better find somebody's newly washed clothes hanging out and do it soon, Joda thought. Disguised, he might be able to try passing unnoticed out of the heavy gates of al Despite himself, he looked back, long enough to see one of the guardsmen toss the core of his apple aside. His partner had gathered their short pikes, and the apple guard took his from his companion. Then the pair of them headed down the street, toward Joda. A thin alley appeared to his left, sneaking through a collection of fishmonger shops, and Joda dodged down the narrow passage. He was convinced that the guardsmen had spotted him and were now following him, waiting for the right moment to strike. Full fight was now the only option. Joda ran two steps down the alley and slammed into something hard. He rebounded, falling backward on the fog dampened cobblestones. Then, the something he slammed into was covered with thick cloth, but beneath the cloth, was the unrelenting firmness of granite. Joda looked up into the cowl of a hooded figure and wondered if he had run into a statue that had been wrapped up for transport. Then the statue moved, and Joda tried to scramble backward away from the thing. It was taller than Joda, but hunched forward. Its shoulders were at the same height with where its hidden ears should be. Its face was partially concealed beneath a long drooping cowl, but all Joda could see beneath the cowl were more rags wrapped around its face. It was robed in the dark grayish rags, the same shade as the sky above them, the same colors Joda might have seen the night before when something had tripped him in the forest. The ragged man held a long, blue-white, thin-fingered hand out, palm down, fingers splayed. Joda froze in place. The ragged man brought his other hand toward what would be his face, a single elongated finger raised toward his hidden mouth. Joda stopped breathing. With his first hand, the ragged man pointed toward the narrow entry of the alley. The two guardsmen walked past. One was walking slowly, the other still staring at the sky. Neither looked down the alley. Joda let himself start breathing again. He looked at the ragged figure in the alley. In the increasing light, the figure seemed to grow less imposing. He was tall, but more emaciated than powerful. He seemed solid, but the morning breeze tucked at the frayed hem of the rope. His arms were too long and too thin to be human. Who are you? Joda said in a gravely whisper. He cleared his throat, 
and asked again. What are you? Can you help me get out of the city? The ragged man pointed toward the entrance of the alley, and Joda slowly rose and crept along the wall to the main thoroughfare. Across the street was a fishmonger's stall. Its overhanging shutter was already open, and both husband and wife were laying out the wares. Salted fish, likely from the port of Get. They were arguing as they laid out the dried shad, shark, haddock, and eel on low wooden tables in front of the shop. Of greater interest to Joda was a small wagon in front, hooked to a pair of old worn-out horses. The wagon was half-filled with barrels, three feet high. As Joda watched, one of the other workers in the shop rolled another barrel out of the doorway and hefted it, unaided, onto the back of the wagon. Empty barrels then, thought Joda. Salted fish had to come overland from Ged, and they wanted the barrels back to use again. Empty barrels. Heading for Ged. Joda turned to ask the ragged man what he thought, but the creature was gone. Only the gray walls, the shade of his tattered clothing, remained. There was a crash behind Joda, from the direction of the fishmonger's shop. Something in the back of the shop had fallen, and both husband and wife bustled back to the scene of the disaster, leaving the front of the shop unguarded. Joda crossed the street, and looked both ways. The street was still mostly deserted for the moment, save for a few merchants worrying about their own stock. The young man clambered onto the wagon and pushed down on one edge of a barrel lid, the other end raised. It had not been set firmly, because it carried nothing important. The unpleasant aroma of concentrated salt and ancient fish burned in Joda's nostrils. He looked around, and there were no guards. No one paying attention. No one who apparently thought he was anything more than a workman rearranging the barrels. Joda stepped into the barrel and crouched down, refastening the lid as he did so. He lost the last bit of light as he heard the returning voices of the fishmonger and his wife. His barrel rocked as similar barrels and ancient crates were loaded onto the wagon. After a short while, there was the cry of the teamster, and the wagon lurched forward. They moved agonizingly so at first, threading their way through the streets of al Sur. Twice they stopped, and Joda was sure that they were heavy, mechanically powered gates of the city, but each time, they started up again after a brief interruption. The third time they stopped, it had to be at the gates, for there were indistinct voices beyond the barrel. One was rough and guttural, the teamster himself. The other was equally rough, but authoritarian, perhaps the captain of the gate guard. Then, there was a hollow noise of an empty barrel being thumped, sounding like a wooden toy drum. Then another. Then another. A cold drop of sweat ran down Joda's back. The guards were checking the barrels. A Joda-filled barrel would sound very different from one containing only the odors of salted fish. The thumping got near, though it was erratic. Were they checking every barrel, wondered Joda, or were they checking only the ones they could reach? Despite himself, he stopped breathing again. The barrel next to him was thumped, for Joda could feel the vibrations through the wooden sides of his hiding place. Then, there was a pause, and Joda could only hear his heart pounding. Then another thump, this one on the other side of him, and continuing thumps as they moved away from him. At last, there was the authoritarian shout, and the wagon began to lurch forward again. Only then did Joda take a deep breath, and he had a fight to contain the gagging cough from inhaling bits of particulate salt and fish that had been within the barrel for far too long. Joda would get out of all sewer. He would be able to creep away from the wagon and reach Ged. Bosco would find him, and the pair of them would take a long sea trip, hopefully to some place where the church was not so powerful. But the first thing Joda would do once he got out of the barrel, he resolved, was to wash the stench of salt and fish off of him, even if he had to bathe in ice-cold water to do it.